Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome uh, to our session today, Field Problems with Aerial Fiber Optic Cables, Part 2. If you missed Part 1, that was on OPGW, and you can find that on our website uh, if you'd like to go review that. And I'm Mike Riddle, president of NCAB and kind of chief technical guru too. And uh, let's keep moving. So uh, to start off with, this is an RCEP compliant uh, presentation. So that means that we meet their standards for giving continuing education credits. It does not mean that they agree with any of the content here. It just means that uh, we've met their um, uh, the requirements to be able to give continuing education credits. At the end, uh, I will uh, tell you what, what will happen. You know, there'll be a follow up if you need the credits, you have to go take a test. I'll give you more information about that later. So the purpose and learning objectives today are to talk about uh, the biggest problems that utilities are experiencing with their aerial fiber optic cables and where I can to give you insight on how you can present prevent the problems or at least kind of mitigate against them. So the specific objectives here you can see listed. Uh, I'll give you a moment to review them. Key. And we'll keep going. And then the format. So you've already had the introduction. We've already reviewed the learning objectives. Uh, we're about to hit the presentation. And then at the end, we'll have question and answers. And then let's uh, please try to keep them on topic. And uh, I'll stay for as long as you guys got questions. And we'll we'll get rolling. So the the genesis of all of this really was when I began these uh, series of webinars that we've hosted on various aspects of fiber optics and fiber optic cables. The the idea was to share in information. Now, I, I've been in the industry for a long time, and uh, I, I see a lot of new faces, and I think there are a lot of things that maybe aren't taught in engineering school but rather you pick up in the course of day-to-day -day activities. And, and I just wanted to share as much of that information as possible. And then this presentation and the one before it are still in that same spirit, but it just occurred to me that I, I'd seen a lot of problems with cables over the years. And to share, uh, to share that might be beneficial to y'all. So, um, what goes wrong and then how to solve it is is one dimension there but also the notion of if your utility is having problems you might not be alone and if enough of you are having problems then maybe we can get together and talk about it and brainstorm and come up with solutions for problems so there was that aspect too that i wanted it to be active uh, to throw information out there and maybe generate further discussion on the point uh, so, and, and then it turned out I had so much material. I, originally, I envisioned just one presentation talking about both cables, but I realized I had so much material that I really needed to talk about OPGW and ADSS separately. So that's how we got where we got. So, and like the last time, I decided that the best way to, to start was a a report that was commissioned by the UTC a, a few years ago, and we'll give the full citation at the end, but they did a study on ADSS life cycle, and it included uh, surveying utilities about the problems that they were having with their ADSS cable, and this is a chart uh, that showed what they got, how many utilities uh, showed what type of problem. Um, and this particular chart, um, you know, you see kind of stuff all over the place. There's uh, lightning and gunshots and rodents. Those things kind of make clear. Certainly gunshots and rodents are readily understood. 
there's things like right of way clearing and a dump truck with box raised and significant number of utilities had that problem. You know, a dump truck clipped their cable. So um, what they did and what I did too was to organize that. So you to categorize things and the buckets that we put them in were accidents and vandalism, environmental related problems, installation and material, and then tracking. And we'll, we're going to talk about each group and then the causes within each group. And then plus, I'm going to throw in a topic that's commonly known as pistoning at, at the end. Um, that was not separately identified in the UTC report, uh, although it might have been considered an installation problem. But in any event, I've heard enough reports of it that I wanted to include it in today's presentation. So first up, accidents and vandalism. The number one killer of ADSS in the field has been gunshots and specifically shotguns. Um, you can debate whether the cable was being shot intentionally, meaning the ADSS was really the target, or if someone was shooting at something on the cable and instead well, maybe they hit what they were shooting at, but they hit the cable too, or maybe they missed what they were shooting at and hit the cable. Uh, not a lot of comfort for you as a utility if your cable's been damaged. Um, it doesn't give you much comfort if it was intentional or not. It's a problem for you to deal with. And no surprise, when an ADSS cable gets hit by a shotgun blast, it leads to immediate optical damage. And, you know, everybody has a bad day uh, trying to get it fixed. Unfortunately, there is really not a direct solution for this. Um, the only thing that you can do is some mitigating measures. And it, the big thing, I think, is to be prepared, you know, to have an emergency response plan uh, where uh, you know uh, where the equipment is, the OTDR is to go pinpoint the location, and then you've got some spare cable and some hardware um, a couple of dead ends and a splice enclosure so that you can get out there and quickly get your cable back in service again. Now, if the problem is bad enough, and it's, you know, it's one thing if you're having a problem every couple of years or something, it's another thing if it's a repeated problem um, again and again and again and in the same location. In that case, you might want to consider using a different type of fiber optic cable uh, where you've had problems in the past, you know, or if, you know, you have to put a new circuit and you know it crosses a hunting reserve, you know, you might want to head that one off with a different type of cable. Uh, optical phase conductor or optical neutral are other types of cables that you could use on distribution circuits or in the case of optical phase conductor on transmission lines too. Uh, there's also metallic aerial self-supporting cable or optical messenger cable. Um, those solutions are available. Now, there's significant considerations in the use of any of these other cable types that you ought to take into account. Uh, can't go into that in detail today, but I will point out that we did a previous webinar called Fiber Optic Cables 101 where these cables are discussed, and you'll learn what in, in that presentation what some of these other considerations are um, if, if you want to evaluate using one of these other cable solutions. Uh, it does remain the holy grail of ADSS design to come up with a cable that's at least uh, resistant to shotgun damage. Um, NCAB has done some research on that. Unfortunately, we've not come up with anything that we really like yet, think that's meaning we don't really think it's effective. Uh, we're not the only ones. Other cables have too. So um, just some pictures of gunshot damage. This is actually a gun, you know, a literal bullet that hit a cable. And, uh, you know, here you could see uh, a shotgun blast. And this is kind of representative of what you see when you blast an, an ADSS cable with a shotgun. And I've talked about gunshot damage, but maybe I should have been more general and said projectile damage. Because here's a picture. Uh, I hope you see it clearly. This is an arrow that has penetrated 
and an ADSS cable. That doesn't happen too often. So next up on uh, accidents and vandalism in that general category is dump trucks, other types of accidents, uh, including right of way clearing. So equipment being used to clear a right of way uh, and it makes contact with um, the, the ADSS cable. Other accidents would include things like farm equipment, um, clipping a cable and damaging it or even knocking it down. And but these are these all have like a common theme to them. And that is that ADSS is typically attached lower on a structure. So below the uh, the phase conductors, which makes it closer to the ground, which inherently makes it more vulnerable to something hitting it. Um, and it doesn't help that it's made of plastic and other dielectric materials, non-metallic materials. Um, the thing that you have to do then is you absolutely have to check sag, especially vertical, but horizontal as well. And you want to make sure that you're maintaining code code clearances. And you should factor in that code clearances are only minimum. You know, again, in my hyp hypothetical example, if you're going across a hunting reserve, well, maybe that's not a good example. If you're going across uh, a farm, maybe your ground clearance needs to be higher just to make sure that, uh, you know, Farmer Jones doesn't clip your cable. Um, factor in, you know, what's the service, what's your service area, what's happened in the past, design accordingly. It's a similar concept here. Use more clearance if necessary. And other than these two things, there's not much more you can do except consider another cable uh, and be prepared, have, have an emergency response plan um, in place. Uh, just to illustrate that, here's a picture of a cable that got clipped by a dump truck. Um, in this case, I think the dump truck also hit the phase conductors as well. Uh, you know, a little bit of a, I shouldn't make light of it. You know, you can see several structures got taken down. Next up, environmentally induced failures. Uh, rodents, and that includes, or maybe even especially squirrels, are the second leading cause of ADSS failure, a close number two to gunshot damage. And um, it's uh, squirrels and rodents are just not at all deterred by uh, aramid, uh, more commonly known as Kevlar. Uh, to them, I guess it's tasty, seeing how much they seem to enjoy chewing on it. Uh, this tends to be a problem in specific areas. So as for as far as solutions, you're back to this concept of know your service territory and uh, plan accordingly. Uh, however, in this case, I can offer you some potential solutions there. Um, there are anti-rodent measures that you can take that you can incorporate into the cable that you're using. Uh, that will help. Uh, the first thing that you can do is add uh, an additive into the outer jacket that makes the cable taste and smell bad uh, to the critters. But um, it's Okay, I think my internet service cut out for a moment. So the additive, it's questionable how effective it would be, especially long term. So I give that, you know, your ABC grading uh, uh, system a C minus. Uh, the next thing that you could do possibly is add fiberglass yarn for strength instead of aramid. Uh, rodents don't like to chew on it. Um, now, they'll still chew through the outer jacket, but then the fiberglass yarn will stop them. Um, you can repair that outer damage with jacket repair tape. And if you couple that with an inner jacket, uh, to protect your optical core, you can easily get a cable with at least a B. 
again, the ABCD rating on it. Uh, third, you can use fiberglass reinforced plastic rod, FRP, which is normally used in the center of a cable. More people will call it a central strength member, but it's really there to be an anti-buckling element. Gives some strength to the cable, not a lot compared to the aramid, but you can use a bunch of those um, and strand them around an inner jacket and use them actually as a structural support element and you'll get excellent rodent resistant. The critters will not chew through it. Again, you do have that outer jacket damage, but you can repair that with jacket repair tape, and you have to have that inner jacket, so you are protecting your optical core. Um, it's a good construction, it works well. And, and before moving off of rodents, I also wanted to mention that some utilities had problems with large birds, like uh, in particular, large birds of prey. Um, hawks, for example, and the talons can pierce through the jacket, uh, the outer jacket, and cause problems in some cases. So, moving on, uh, here are critter killers. Um, uh, this is just an amazing picture. I have no idea what this little guy thought he was trying to do, but uh, funny picture. But you can see how they've chewed through the outer jacket and damaged the strength member to uh, here more damage uh, here significant damage to. So you uh, I do note that they didn't chew through the actual buffer tubes here, but the it's likely that the buffers are going to fail because uh, eventually water will get through the plastic. To keep moving. Next environmental problem is fire, and fire is a problem in certain parts of the country. And I have to note that once a traditional ADSS cable gets ignited, the polyethylene, and it doesn't matter whether it's low density or high density or medium density polyethylene, it's going to continue to burn. And so then your cable can actually help propagate a fire. And obviously, that's not good. Um, the solution here, again, uh, you'll see the theme today, know your service territory and plan accordingly. You know, If you know you're going across an area where it's likely that there could be fires, well, then you should take that into account. Um, plan accordingly, as I keep saying. Uh, in this case, though, I can offer fire rated cables. You can change that uh, outer jacket material, so at least the cable does not help the fiber spread. Um, now, dielectric materials, meaning plastic in particular, are still going to burn. If you really want a fire resistant cable, you're going to have to add metal to it. And even that is going to have its limitations, no surprise. Um, but what you can achieve with an all dielectric cable is you can get a fire uh, rating on it. Um, that outer jacket material and some uh, fire resistant tape uh, to protect the core can give you time. And you could get uh, at least eight hours, excuse me, at least three hours, maybe up to eight hours. Um, uh, if, if you design the cable accordingly. And that would give you time um, if you're using fiber optic sensing uh, in conjunction with whatever else you're using your cable for, you could identify the location of where the fire is occurring, uh, know that you've got uh, three hours and be able to send uh, fire suppression teams to put out the fire and go ahead and initiate your emergency repair plan that you developed earlier that we've we've talked about already. So um, it helps, not 100% solution, but you can make things better. Uh, next environmental is lightning, and that's really not directly affecting the cable from uh, what I've read, it's more that lightning has hit a structure and initiated a fire, and then the fire has damaged the cable and or the, the supporting hardware. Um, <clears throat> again, not much that you can do here. 
uh, lightning's going to do what lightning's going to do, but good grounding and bonding does help improve lightning uh, performance, um, especially on transmission lines. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. And then, uh, you know, I mentioned fire rated cables. If, if it's an area that's known to have a problem, you know, that might help in those locations as well. Next up, ice. And for a long time in the US, uh, there were people that went around and said that you don't have to worry about ice accumulation on ADSFs. And it's just not true. They were claiming that ADSS, because it's plastic, um, that it sheds ice like uh, old fashioned plastic ice cube trays. If, if you're familiar with those, you had plastic ice trays, you put water in them, you freeze them, and then you would twist the tray a little bit and the ice in theory would pop out. I say in theory because if anybody's actually worked with them, and I have, the ice didn't always come out. And so there might be some underlying grain of truth to that argument. But in the real world, there absolutely are cases when ice does accumulate it on a cable, just like there were cases in when I used to have plastic ice trays where the ice didn't pop out like it was supposed to. And these pictures prove my point. So you can see in this case, the cable has accumulated so much ice that it's been brought down to eye level of this gentleman standing in the right of way. Here's another case. And actually, if you look closely at this picture, it's fascinating because one cable has got a lot of ice on it. And there's another cable on, on this right of way that doesn't have hardly any. And then here's a third picture, another instance of a cable brought down uh, by ice loading actually to ground level. So it really does happen and you really should plan for it. Now, interestingly, the ice is not likely to directly fail the cable. So notice in this case and in this case, how much sag there is in the cable. Well, with ADSS, it's dielectric, meaning plastic, so it's a little bit stretchy. Um, so the cable's not outright breaking. Uh, by the way, that's further compounded by the fact or added to by the fact that uh, there's a big difference in ADSS cable between the actual breaking strength of the cable and the maximum rated cable load, which is the maximum tension that you design to. And typically it's a factor of 50%, roughly, meaning that your maximum rated cable load is on the order of 50% of the breaking strength. So again, you end up with a situation where the cable can take the ice load without breaking, but because it's brought the cable so low to the ground, you have no clearance or inadequate clearance, which means you're vulnerable to contact damage. You know, those dump trucks or somebody in the case of the picture you saw before, somebody driving over the cable. Uh, you know, if, if the cable is that low and crossing a road, um, uh, that can be a problem. Uh, another thing that happens is uh, ice tubes in, in areas where there's a significant elevation difference, the ice breaks off in chunks. And you can see that there's like a little part missing here and you can get another little part missing and you get a tube. And under certain conditions, the tube will end up sliding down towards uh, the low point of the sag. And in some cases with significant elevation difference, but you know, one structure to another, the it slid down and crashed into the dead end at the bottom of say a slope and um and damaged the hardware or the cable itself in that process. So these ice tubes can cause problems. Um the solution, well, first uh, Yet again, know your service, terry, service territory and design for a realistic accumulation of ice. And if you're in an area like th this is mountainous terrain where you do have elevation differences, there are ice breakers that are available on the market that you can install so that if a tube slides down, um, it, it's uh, much less likely to damage the cable or 
uh, the hardware. So now installation related failures. So first up is damage during installation, and you've got uh, two broad categories or subcategories in, in this category. First is jacket damage during stringing, and then second is damage during splicing, which boils down to the fiber damage or tray problems. And then I mentioned at the beginning that we'll talk about pistoning, but I'm going to do that separately later. So first up, jacket damage during stringing. You can get abrasion, scuffing, or tearing of the jacket or holes in the jacket during pull-in. And that can be caused, um, or the causes of that will be different depending upon the type of uh, stringing process that you're using. With, with ADSS, there are two types of stringing that are used. First up is control tension stringing. And that's where you, you basically have a reel stand and a bull wheel tensioner, and you're pulling the cable through a series of stringing blocks using some kind of a pulling machine. This is a, you know, an illustration of it. And if you're using that, that type of installation method, the stringing blocks themselves are super important. The other method that's used is called the moving reel method. And in that case, you put the reel on the back of a truck or a reel trailer or whatever, and you go from one structure, you hoist it up and attach it, you drive to the next structure, hoist it up and attach it, and so forth and so on. Um, in that method, it's the hoisting process and the tools that you use that could be damaging your cable. So that's what to be careful about. Let's go back. So with the controlled tension method, um, if the cable rides up out of the block groove and drags along the frame, bad things can happen. If the block doesn't rotate freely, bad things can happen. If the block's surface itself is damaged, bad things can happen. And I, sh um, I now realize I forgot to dig up a picture of this. There are trunnion clamps that suppliers will tell you you can use for pulling in a cable in lieu of blocks. However, cable manufacturers generally don't like doing that, and NCAB is one of those. It's If you're going to use control tension, uh, we believe you should use proper stringing blocks, not trunnion-type supports. Um, and I already mentioned, if you're using the moving reel method, uh, damage during that hoisting process is the thing to focus on and try to prevent. And the common denominator in both is pay attention to the tools and equipment that you're using on your cable. Now, surprisingly, jacket damage during stringing is not really a big problem. Most of the time, the damage is superficial. You know, the jacket gets scuffed. Uh, or abraded, um, not really a, a big problem there per se. It has to be severe, in particular, uh, get a jacket breach, meaning a hole or a split in the outer jacket. And even then, jacket repair tape can usually be used to fix that. Um, we already talked about the controlled method, and we already mentioned you got to focus and make sure that your blocks are in good condition. Uh, another thing to pay attention of so that you prevent that riding out of the groove is that around angles, your block should be supported so that the block and the cable stay in the same plane. Like you see in this illustration here or here, you don't want this situation because the cable is going to tend to ride out of the block and get caught around here and bad things can happen. Uh, this is just an, another way of supporting the block from the bottom. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention with ADSS, the, the plastic aerial buddy blocks from Jameson are excellent because the block being made out of plastic and the cable made out of plastic, it's like, you know, a marriage made in heaven almost. The same material and the plastic blocks are a lot lighter than the metal ones. So that further helps things stay in alignment and 
prevent bad things from happening. Moving real, we talked about be careful with the tools and the process that you use for hoisting the cable. So next up, damage during splicing. And uh, people that listen to me when I talk about ADSS, I think I probably conclude that I have it out for splice techs. And there's some truth to that in some ways. But today, uh, I do want to apologize because this is going to sound like dumping on them. When you have damage during splicing, it's always poor handling. Sorry. Um, if you kink the tubes, if you bent them too tight, um, if you didn't enter them, you know, when you cut into them to so that you expose the fibers, if you did that badly, you're asking for trouble. Sorry. I, the only thing I can say is, you need to be better at your job. Sorry. Um, polypropylene tubes are common here in the United States, and they're the, the really the only reason that they're so popular is because they're forgiving to the careless. From a technical standpoint, if you've heard me, I don't like that material. Um, I poly, uh, polybutylene, PBT, is much more reliable and durable but it has one problem, um, it's easier to kink. So you have to be reasonably careful when you're doing that. Yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you uh, beyond what I've already said, which is probably too much. Um, damaging the fiber, if you, if you uh, damage the fibers during tube entry, right? If you cut the tube too deep, you can be uh, cutting into the fibers inside. And you might not notice that too. You can damage the coating for sure and maybe even get into the cladding. Um, likewise, if you're uh, not being careful when you're doing the stripping and or the cleaving, again, you can damage the fiber itself. I, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, there, there's a certain level of skill that I think is necessary to properly handle fiber optic cable and the, Cable suppliers shouldn't be expected to keep dumbing things down, in my opinion, because most of those things actually compromise the long-term reliability of the cable. That's another presentation for another time, but anyway. Uh, next thing, the poor splicing, the actual splicing itself um, could not be bad or could be done poorly. And in the process, you could exceed the minimum fiber bending radius. That's bad. Uh, doing do a poor job of stripping or cleaving, and then you'll you're more likely to get a fiber splice that's not very good. Um, if you do your splicing and you don't make sure the environment and your immediate working conditions are clean, you can get contamination during the process and thereby end up with a bad splice. And if your splicer is not in good condition. Um, you know, not old, not working properly, whatever, anything along those lines, you can get a bad splice and have problems later as a consequence of it. Uh, once you've done the splice, the splicing itself, you have to organize the trays um, in the enclosure. Um, in that process, that's when you can kink the tubes. You can bend them too tight. Uh, when you're putting the splice protectors into the tray, don't if you don't do a good job of that or you arrange them in some weird manner, you can cause macro bends and thereby cause problems later. Um, not properly arranging or securing the trays themselves uh, can cause problems uh, later uh, during operation. So, uh, you know, other problems here. So, the solution to all of this, I'm sorry to say this, Ken, dumping on splice techs, I, I apologize, but proper training and they need to have good experience. Um, and one component of proper training and good experience is to drill into them that they have to follow both the cable supplier and the enclosure supplier's guidelines. Um, Somehow I repeated this, but really this is just, uh, really your solutions are here. Somehow I left this on this slide by mistake. So next up, 
installation. So corrosion and material defects. Um, in the UTC report, they don't explain a lot about what they mean here. And I suspect that that's actually uh, either on the hardware itself leading to um, damage later or something that they're seeing on the jacket that was being reported and calling it corrosion. But that sounds to me like that's really material, a, a material problem or a manufacturing defect. Um, and they did include material defects in this category. The material defects have two forms or two flavors of that. The first is the quality of the materials themselves. Are you using high quality polyethylene or polypropylene for that matter or whatever? Uh, but then you can take good material and process it badly and then you won't get a good cable, no surprise. So there's the quality of the manufacturing processes itself. And one particular thing that your cable supplier needs to pay attention to is part of the extrusion process should include purification, where you remove all dust and contamination from the plastic material, and drying, where you 100% remove moisture from the material before going into the extrusion head. If a supplier is not careful about that, immediately after production, you'll have a cable that looks okay, but then once it gets to the field, problems are going to manifest themselves. And I believe that that's what's being called here corrosion, um, at least when it comes to the cable itself. So the solution here, I can only say buy from quality suppliers. Uh, before moving on, I did want to mention jacket tears. Uh, those were not specifically talked about in the, the UTC report, but here's a picture from of one in the field. And you can see that the jacket has torn, exposing the aramid underneath. And note this necking down here. Um, a lot of times this is blamed on the cable, but in reality, there's at least a 60% chance that that's actually the dead end design. So the dead end has allowed there to be a stress concentration at one point. It, it overloads the jacket's ability to resist that and the jacket therefore tears. Um, a variation of that is uh, you have to transition the strength in the cable uh, in, in the strength element. So if it's aramid to aramid, it has to go through the jacket to get to the dead end and then to the structure. You know, that's the underlying physics of what's going on there. So because that jacket is plastic, you need to make sure that that transition occurs over a certain distance and it needs to be smooth. If you get a concentration, you can get a jacket tear, but likewise, if you just don't do that transition over enough uh, enough of a distance, you can get a jacket tear too. Um, so big chance that it's the dead end design, but I have to allow that there is the possibility of it being the cable design. Um, you know, if the if the outer jacket material uh, is too soft or too thin. Well, yeah, that can lead to a jacket tear as well. So I can't completely blame the dead ends, but I do think in my experience, my observation has been that most of the time uh, the, the dead end was the major factor. And in the picture that I showed you, I, I know a little bit more about that case. It, in my opinion, it was the dead end. So how do you solve that? Um, well, the, the thing to do is to make sure that the cable and the hardware manufacturer have both agreed that their products are going to work together on your system. So don't buy a cable and then assume you can buy from some hardware supplier and the hardware supplier, yeah, it's okay, um, because you're asking for finger pointing later. Um, likewise, uh, you know, the reverse is true, where the cable supplier says it's okay, but then 
uh, you buy from the hardware supplier and uh, then later the cable supplier, oh, well, you know, it's, it's that hardware you bought. Uh, the best thing that you can do is make sure that both companies are in agreement that their products are going to work well together as a system. Tracking induced failures. Uh, this was the, the last category in the UTC report. And basically, when there's a tracking failure, it's always the result of ADSS being in too high of an electric field. Now, for a standard polyethylene jacket, that field is 12.5 kV per meter. With a tracking resistant jacket, um, you can get up to 25 kV per meter. Now, if the field is actually stronger than that, there actually is a workaround for that. You can use what is called a grading bar or a grading tube uh, as a workaround and still get good performance without tracking being a problem. And that's an, a real thing. Um, Monty Tiominen, I saw, uh, joined our webinar and uh, he is retired from BPA and BPA has thousands of miles on their system where they did exactly that. So it's not theoretical, it really can work. Um, but, but essentially what you're doing there in that situation is reducing the field so that it's within an acceptable limit. If you have a problem, it, otherwise it's because the field has uh, been allowed to get it to be too high uh, for what the cable. Sort of an exception in heavy pollution areas with poor natural wash cycles. Um, what's going on there is the contamination builds up on the jacket and a little bit of water allows for tracking. So in, if you have that kind of an environment, the thing to do is to basically bump these down one level. So if, if I have such an area and I think the field is going to be 12.5 kV, I have to go ahead, instead of using a standard jacket, use a tracking resistant jacket. If I think the field is going to be higher than 12.5 uh, kV per meter, uh, and I'm in such an area, well, I better plan on using the grading bars because just the tracking resistant jacket might not be enough. Um, you can get insight in an area as to whether you're likely to have a problem or not by looking at your utilities experience with insulators. Because if you have an area and you're routinely having to, or just as a standard practice, you are over insulating, it's because of this kind of problem that you're doing that. And if you're having that problem with your insulators, so say instead of 138 kV insulators, you're using of the equivalent of, I don't know, two, 230 kV insulators. If you're doing that, it's because you've got some problem like this going on, and the way to, to deal with your ADSS then is to, oops, excuse me, uh, treat it one, one step higher, right? So again, if it's a, if you, if it really ought to support a standard jacket, go ahead and use the track resistant jacket. If you're already using the track resistant jacket, you better add grading bars or tubes uh, to your system. Um, you can get further insight into this using space potential analysis. And uh, we have a webinar on that too, and, uh, and a tool on our website that, that you can use to do space potential analysis. That'll, that'll tell you if you're gonna have a problem or not except it doesn't factor in this. That's still a little bit advanced um, to the next level um, if, if you've got environmental problems. So next up, pistoning. So pistoning is when the fibers push out of the buffer tubes in the splice enclosure in the tray. So originally the fibers that you see in this picture, hopefully you can see it clearly, nicely arranged around the outside edge of the splice tray, but the fiber has pushed out and it's pushed out so far that it's way outside the tray. When it pushes, it can lead to micro macro bending, which in turn can lead to increased attenuation. So that's not good. And if it's bad enough, I mean, like what you see in this picture, you potentially could break fibers and obviously that's very bad. <clears throat> the 
Pistoning occurs here and there. Um, and the causes of it are pretty debated. Um, contributing factors, though, things that have been proposed, the, the tubes being stranded with too long of a lay length. So uh, you as a user can get insight by looking at the MRCL of the cable and asking the supplier, what's the fiber strain at this point? Because you can't hide when you've reduced the, the excess fiber length, which is the effectively the additional fiber that you have within a cable relative to the unit length of a cable itself. Uh, we talk about that in the ADSS uh, engineering uh, webinar. Um, so if, if you don't have enough excess fiber, then you have a lower zero fiber strain margin, but you'll also have uh, more fiber strain at that maximum rated cable load, which is the maximum tension that the cable is supposed to see in the field. And the way you smoke that out is what's the strain at the MRCL? Because it ought to be, in an ideal case, zero. Um, in a number of cases, it's, it's not necessarily a bad design if the cable is not zero, but you absolutely don't want it to be above 0.2%. And the, the, the cable supplier should be able to tell you what it is. So, if, if they've made the lay length too long, it's going to drop, uh, ex excuse me, it's going to increase the amount of fiber strain at MRCL. It's that simple. I need to put it that way on the slide for the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, the tube material itself could be a, um, a contributing factor. Lower coefficient of friction, is that allowing the fibers to slide out of the, um, of, of the tube and, and, and push out of the tube. Is the tube type a factor? Um, dry tubes, you would expect to be more susceptible to this problem because there's no gel. The gel inside the tube is actually doing several things in the tube, one of which is helping the fibers hold their shape, meaning stay in place. Um, so in theory, you would expect that dry tubes would be more susceptible to pistoning. And I'm going to come back to that thought in just a minute versus flooded tubes because the gel uh, should be holding them in place. But what if the gel's too thin? Then, uh, you know, you can imagine that gel that's very thick might do a good job of holding the fibers in place. But what if it's more like water? Well, then it's not going to do much at all. Um, so it, this has been thought to be a factor. And then last up, environmental. So uh, an ADSS cable could be swaying with the wind just as the normal course. And that, that motion could be working the tubes and the fibers um, and giving a tendency for the fibers to want to straighten out. And therefore, when they straighten out, the they would be having to move uh, away from the mid span. And ultimately, the only place they can go is to push out of the splice trays. So I kind of suspect that this is a significant factor. And the reason that I say that is because um, when you hear reports of pistoning, it's here and there. So I've seen it happen with dry tubes, but also with flooded tubes. and and in uh, you know, what, at one customer, it, and it didn't happen with the dry tubes, but it did happen with the gel filled. So that can't be the total story. Um, it did happen with polypropylene, but not with PVT. But then I can find another case that contradicts that. Um, I I think more data needs to be collected. Uh, I think we need to look at things like. Uh, what was the fiber strain at MRCL or what was the lay length? Um, you know, is there a correlation between the material? Well, you need more data in order to analyze that. You know, is there a correlation with the tube type? Um, could it be environmental? And the, uh, you know, I, I think the industry needs to collect more data to understand what's really going here. At the moment, 
Uh, they're just a bunch of anecdotes, and they often are contradictory in terms of what conclusions to draw from them. Um, now, for you as the user, okay, well, what do I, what do you do today? Because who knows when or even if the industry will collect that data and make understand what the pattern is and therefore what the solutions might be. Well, for now, what I can tell you is you ought to talk to the cable supplier. They ought to be a, be ready, willing, and able to come out, uh, see what's going on, um, and try to understand. Um, and I can just add this other thought. If you do nothing and you just continue to use the same cable uh, and hope that the problem goes away, well, you're kind of asking for just more trouble. You know, uh, there's an old expression, hope is not a strategy. Um, and then there's also the expression I used on this slide, doing the same thing and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. So uh, you need to look at it, talk with the cable supplier, and think about trying something different. That's my thought there. So I've mentioned uh, fiber strain, so I do want to close with a brief discussion of fiber strain. And basically, that's when fibers have tension on it. Why should you care about it? Because um, first, you need to understand the background. Every cable has a zero fiber strain margin. So below a certain tension, there is no strain, meaning no tension on the fiber, and above that point, there is. Uh, now, um, at maximum rated design tension, it's possible that there might be no strain on it, meaning the zero fiber strain point and the maximum rated cable load are the same value, or there could be strain there. It depends upon the cable design, what the cable designer was trying to do. So per corning, you want to keep the strain on a fiber. If you're going to have strain, you want to keep it at 0.2%. That's considered very low. And the expected life that you get, it's a probability calculation. So this is not a guarantee. The expected life works out to be 40 years or more. But when you, in, when you increase strain, you increase the probability of failure. And it's kind of a long logarithmic function, meaning uh, it goes up pretty darn fast. In, or as fiber strain increases, it very quickly reduces that expected life. So a strain of just 0.3%, you've gone from about 40 years to about 40 days. Um, it accumulates over time. Um, so what happens is if you have a fiber under strain and you're beginning to get damage, microscopic damage to the fiber, when you remove that strain, that damage is still there. It doesn't just go away. Um, so it accumulates over time and cyc cyclic loading is a compounding factor because glass is strong but very brittle. Uh, where does it come from in a cable? Well, first of all, the cable design, and the you should have a sinusoidal shape inside the tubes, but you can understand that you could have a very long period of the sinusoidal shape or a short one. And then when you take this, the tubes and strand them, you further increase the, um, the excess fiber length, which in turn uh, increases your zero fiber strain margin. But again, there too, you can have a long way length, so you just get a little bit of extra fiber in the in that unit length of cable, or you can have a short lay length, um, and in which case you'll get more. Now, too short will cause other problems, so you end up, uh, a cable designer ends up with the balancing act here. Uh, the second source is the cable manufacturing. So you could have a cable that's designed well, but then not made well. Um, these would be uh, processing problems that the cable manufacturer. And then your operating conditions. So wind and ice, um, they could cause more strain than you expect or higher, yeah, higher strain than what the cable was designed for or you can spend more time under strain than what you expected. 
So what are the solutions here? Well, um, you should be asking your cable supplier to provide you the zero fiber strain margin point and what the strain is at uh, maximum rated cable load. Um, they know that. Uh, they should be measuring the, the excess fiber length, which is, which is that um, sinusoidal shape in their tubes as part of their processes. And it ought to be at least a value of about 0.25%. Um, there might be some exceptions to that, but again, they should know and they should be willing to share that information with you. And then you might want to consider collecting weather data um, because you, if you know that your cable has experienced a certain amount of strain and you can predict that based upon the loading on the cable, well, then you can predict when your cable might have problems, you know, or you can calculate pretty much the odds when, when it's going to fail. Um, but that that requires collecting the data and analyzing it. And at the IEEE subcommittee, we are looking at working up a guideline for exactly that. Probably we would start with OPGW, but the concept should then readily uh, extend to ADSS. So We've talked about all the things that can go wrong with your ADSS, and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, there is so much stuff here. Maybe I'm just going to go underground. Um, but I need to walk some of that back. Uh, I do understand that feeling there, but I need to walk it back a little bit because the reality is that when you look at the big picture, ADSS overall still has an excellent track record. And the bottom line is, is that if you got a good cable design with good manufacturing and you're using quality hardware and the proper installation, including splicing uh, techniques, you can easily get 25 plus years of service life. Um, and I need to remind you that underground cables have their problems too. Rodents, especially rats, are a big one, but dig-ins are actually the number one killer of underground systems of all types. Uh, there was an old saying from years ago, there are a heck of a lot more backhoes than there are tornadoes. Uh, and when you have a dig in, the repair can be harder and take longer and cost more. So don't let these problems overwhelm you. ADSS is still a uh, not just a viable, but a go-to solution for getting fiber on all kinds of power lines. Okay. And then cl to close out, I just want to again acknowledge that UTC report uh, on ADSS fiber life cycle. Uh, it's a good report. You can find it here. And they also have a report on OPGW, and that was the basis or my starting point for part one of this series on field problems. So check them out. And that concludes the uh, presentation. I think I've gone a little bit long here. Let's open it up for questions. Uh, Joe's got a question. Uh, can you enable the, the mics, Alexis? Yes. So uh, Joe, uh, hit me with your question. Joe, you there? Oh, okay. What do you mean by low frequency of wind? Um, uh, I, I like uh, basically, I was at a restaurant and I was looking out the window. It was just an ordinary day, and I noticed the cable swaying. Now, you know, Texas, we have wind all the time, but it was not. Um, yeah, it was like a wind like five miles an hour, and the cable was just sort of gently swaying. And I recognized then that with an ADSS cable with the tube stranded, uh, uh, everything would be moving inside the cable. And uh, when it, as the wind speed increases, you, I mean, you can do the calculation yourself. The the cable is going to stretch. And what's going to happen as the cable stretch, the sinusoidal shape of the, the, uh, of the fibers inside the tube, well, it has to elongate. 
Okay, and so then when the wind is removed, the cable is going to go back. But do the fibers go back 100%? Well, honestly, I realized I'd be surprised if they do go back 100%. So if, if it's a little bit of the fibers are slowly incrementally pushing or straightening out at mid span over time, they've got to go somewhere. And the only place that they can go is to the ends. And then when you can when you continue that thought, you end up with the fibers slowly migrating towards the splice enclosures over time. So th that's the the concept that I have th there in mind. I've not worked it out uh, quantitatively, only kind of qualitatively about that going on. Um, so that's the underlying concept there. So I hope that answered your question. OK, yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, so let me go back through the chat. So, um, oh, yeah, and I forgot to tell you guys this. So here's what's going to happen. If you want to get the continuing education credits, well, whether you want to or not, you're, you're going to get a follow-up email. Thanks for attending, by the way. Again, you'll get a follow-up email. Uh, there's a couple things in there. One is a survey for feedback. So please give me feedback to include suggestions for other classes. Like, you know, if there's a topic that you'd like to see us uh, look into and cover, yeah, let us know. Uh, the second thing that's in there is a link where you can get the, the recording and uh, watch it again. Play it for your friends and family. Um, but you can also, at that link, you can download the presentation. So if you want a copy of the slides to share with, again, your colleagues, but also your friends and family, yeah, go for it. Um, and then the third thing is a link where you go and you take a 10-question test, and that's how you get your, um, your, your credits. Take the test, pass the test with 70%, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll send you a certificate for your, your questions. So um, let's see, I think I covered that well. Um, presentation, yeah, just it's on our website. You can go see it again. A very, okay, from, I don't see the name of the person. Oh, Doug Dewart, a very large public utility in our area has experienced ice on ADSS, which has slid down the ADSS and damaged the armor rods on the ADSS. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. And Preform Line Products, I believe, has a product that they call an icebreaker. And that, that what, it's, what it's there for is to, when the ice slides down, it hits something that's designed to break, split the ice so that it doesn't actually damage anything. Uh, we talked about my low frequency wind sway thing already and some compliments. I appreciate the positive feedback. Any other questions? Okay, well, we're a few minutes past the hour. I appreciate your time and attention today and uh, the, the questions we got and the, the additional insights. And um, yeah, have, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great day and uh, we'll have, we'll hope to see all of you next month for our next webinar. Take care.